Good evening and welcome to Shakespeare and Company. We're very excited to have Sophie Collins with us tonight to read from her debut collection, Who is Mary Sue? Mary Sue is a derogatory term used in fan fiction to describe an idealized or implausibly perfect female character. So ideal and implausible, in fact, that such a character must be a poorly disguised version of the author's idealized self associated with narcissism and wish fulfillment, too lacking in realism to be interesting. But tonight's Poetry in the Library guest, Sophie Collins, confronts and questions this epithet, this designation, why, in fact, this definition exists and why it shouldn't. Through a collage of different voices and forms, blending fact, fiction, verse and prose, who is Mary Sue re-examines assumptions about female identity, self-representation, creativity, and authorship that have continued unchallenged for so long. Who is Mary Sue was one of my favorite collections published this year. What I loved was its intelligence, its relentless pursuit of truth, and its expanse. Instead of rushing towards an answer, Collins' poems linger, multiply, and interact in a dialogue that addresses the reader at the same time. The book's message is urgent, yet its method is unhurried. The force and strength of the voices don't come from outburst or fury, but from their honesty and willingness to be exposed, to admit the paradoxes of self-expression. Sophie Collins grew up in Bergen, North Holland, and now lives in Edinburgh. She received an Eric Gregory Award in 2014. She is a lecturer at the University of Glasgow and was recently made a Fellow of the Royal Society for Literature. Small White Monkeys, a text on self-expression, self-help, and shame, was published by Bookworks in 2017 as part of a commissioned residency at Glasgow Women's Library. Her first poetry collection, Who is Mary Sue, was published by Faber and Faber in February 2018 and was named the Poetry Book Society's Spring Choice. Nick Lezard has said in The Guardian that Sophie Collins, at the beginning of her career, has enormous promise. Jane Cuttle says of Who is Mary Sue, a startlingly original text that requests a different mode of reading, one that encourages avoiding labels and easy conclusions. Readers will emerge more interrogative, more invested in the stakes of sexist, limited criticism after finishing this corrective and captivating debut. In Poetry Review, Alexa Winnick calls the collection an urgent interrogation of the cultural conditions that continue to suppress women's voices, a much needed work of stunning feminist complaint. We're thrilled to have her at Shakespeare and Company tonight, so please give it up for Sophie Collins. <laughs> and to begin tonight's event, Sophie Collins will read from Who is Mary Sue before we discuss the book in more detail and invite questions from the audience. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, that was quite an introduction. Um, going to start, I, I usually like to start reading with uh, someone else's poem, but I uh, left my copy of Selima Hill's Bunny, from which I hope to read, um, at home. So I'm going to read uh, the oldest poem in this collection. It was written about eight years ago now, um, and it feels like it was written by someone else. Healers. I encountered a scaffold outside the Holy Trinity Church in Vladimir. At first, I didn't notice her, slumped against the side of the church. She was pretty small for a scaffold, pretty unassuming. Her safety mesh was torn in places and some bleached all over and threatened to dislodge due to a forceful wind that was typical of the season. She was shaking. She was fundamentally insecure. She told me that good foundations are essential, but that the men who had put her together hadn't taken advantage of the right opportunities. Now, each day, someone came by, called her unsafe and also a liability, and then left, failing to initiate the dismantling process that, yes, would have been painful and slow, but kinder. 
International visitors to the church blamed her for the mess of tools and rags on the grounds and for the fact that they could no longer see the church's celebrated mural depicting St. Artemy of Vicola, unusually pious, highly venerated child saint killed by lightning. His dead body radiated light, never showed signs of decay and was in fact said to have affected multiple miracles of healing. I said comforting things to the scaffold, but she only seemed to lean more heavily against the side of the church. We are rarely independent structures, she said, before she dropped a bolt pin, which released a long section of tube, which released another bolt pin, which released several wooden boards, which scraped another tube and made an unbearable sound. Oh, hello. <laughs> um... Uh, so, Mary Sue is a book that I find quite difficult to summarise or to give a succinct, a succinct account of. Um, it's a poetry collection and it contains lyric poems, prose poems, but um, I'd also describe it as a poetics. Um, so those lyric poems are punctuated by what I'd call for want of a better term, uh, lyric essays. And some readers have said uh, that they feel that those essays are sort of uh, instructing them on how to read the book. Uh, one reviewer in the TLS said that he felt chided by the book, which pleased me. Um, so I'm going to read the title piece that Sarah mentioned, who is Mary Sue, um, which is about the presumptive politics of writing, as has been said. And then I'll go straight on to uh, a long prose poem, which sort of winds throughout the book, called The Engine, which I'll read in its entirety. And there's not a great deal that you uh, need to know about The Engine, other than that it comes in three parts. Um, those parts aren't sort of demarcated in any formal way, but are marked by a sort of change in context. Who is Mary Sue? Coined by Paula Smith in 1973, Mary Sue is a pejorative term used by writers and readers of fan fiction to describe protagonists who are believed to be thinly disguised versions of the fanfic author's idealised self. There is no outright consensus as to Mary Sue's character type. Invariably, however, Mary Sue is female. She is said to be difficult to identify with, poorly constructed and without depth. She is associated with narcissism and or wish fulfillment. I read that fear of creating a Mary Sue may be restricting and even silencing some writers. I don't know if I should be sending this to you, wrote one young author in her cover letter to a magazine. I'm afraid it's a Mary Sue, only I don't know what that is. On the iconic cover of her book, How to Suppress Women's Writing, Joanna Russ lists in a large italicized tangerine font a set of common objections to female authored works. Among them, she wrote it, but look what she wrote about. The bedroom, the kitchen, her family, other women. She wrote it, but she isn't really an artist and it isn't really art. It's a thriller, a romance, a children's book. It's sci-fi. Inside, men and women, whites and people of colour do have very different experiences of life and one would expect such differences to be reflected in their art. I wish to emphasise here that I am not talking vis-a-vis -vis sex about the relatively small area of biology but about socially enforced differences. Russ shares an anecdote. She is on a creative writing MA committee of three professors. The other two professors are male. The committee has the unenviable task of reading approximately 200 manuscripts during the university's admissions period. In part one of the anecdote, Russ recalls disagreeing with her two male colleagues on the believability of a short story by a woman, which ends with the female protagonist lying in bed next to her sleeping husband, wishing she had the courage to mutilate him with a piece of cooking equipment. In part two, Russ remembers being impressed by a woman's poem in which a girl returning home from a date with a boy she does not like, throughout the evening the girl has had to work at it opens the white refrigerator in her mother's kitchen to find that its interior is entirely covered with red cabbage roses. 
The male professors find the anger of the story's protagonist overstated and the poem's essential image unrecognisable, disengaged. Neither woman is admitted to the creative writing course. Russ again. If women's experience is defined as inferior to, less important than, or narrower than men's experience, women's writing is automatically denigrated. She wrote it, but look what she wrote about, becomes she wrote it, but it's unintelligible, badly constructed, thin, spasmodic, uninteresting, etc. A statement by no means identical with she wrote it, but I can't understand it in which case the failure might be with the reader. Thus Mary Sue becomes, in my eyes, an unwitting embodiment of the double standard of content. I note that in literary fiction, when a female writer's female protagonist is considered up to scratch, she is often taken to be a thinly disguised version of the author's non-idealised self. Something like... A woman who tries to invent in literature will fail, whereas a woman who succeeds in writing is believed to have done so to the extent that she has been able to accurately portray the details of her own life. She wrote it, that, but, but the protagonist's all her, a Mary Sue. I begin to collect quotations, responses. Among them, interviewer. Could you say a little more about the relationship of your fictional characters to you, their author? The usual prurient question about how autobiographical an author's fiction is, is especially tempting in your case. Laurie Moore. Why is the usual prurient question especially tempting in my case? Is it really? Interviewer. So tell me, your new book, it features a woman who is from the islands, who has a husband who's a composer. They live in a northeastern town. She has two kids. Sounds a lot like you. How autobiographical is it? Jamaica Kincaid. It's not about me, but it's about things that I'm familiar with, and I hope a reader coming to it doesn't look for clues about anything that happened to me. It's about something deeper. My own self, my own everyday life, is sort of very untidy and smelly and kind of revolting, really. Interviewer. Roland Barthes writes, Every biography is a novel that dares not speak its name. Is the unnamed narrator of 90s actually called Lucy? Lucy Ives. The narrator's name could be Lucy, but her name is certainly not Lucy Ives, or at any rate she isn't me. The narrator doesn't have a life in the same way that you or I do, which is of course obvious, but all the same, I want to say that I don't intend for this narrator to have a life. I intend for her to tell this story. Sharon Olds. I would use the phrase apparently personal poetry for the kind of poetry that I think people are referring to as confessional. Apparently personal, because how do we really know? We don't. Rachel Cusk. The misuse of the term narcissism in relation to my work is nauseating. My life is the trash going into the incinerator to power the book I'm trying to write. The Engine I was able to fall asleep anywhere except in my own bed. I experienced a persistent vice-like pain in my stomach often followed by blood. I would usually take it upon myself to examine the blood, and the blood would usually contain sediment. I became aware of visual irregularities in the inner city air, and understood them to be the physical manifestations of satellite signals. I attached great importance to the occasion of the manifestations having revealed themselves to me, and referred to this event privately as the faith docking. I had incestuous dreams about our father. I learned the names of the Earth's artificial satellites and began to worship them as saints. I had incestuous dreams. On my walks, I began to notice more bonfires than ever before. I was reluctant to speculate on a cause, but the hillside fields were plainly covered in scabs. Horses roamed outside the stations like dogs and with the versatility of dogs. They maintained, however, a horse's incuriousness. My only reading was of signs, but I read a lot of signs. I began to recognise myself in glinting moats across the city's floors. A theory about perennially leafless trees 
They are petrified angels. On a particular morning, I woke with cold lips and nose and the desire to bite down onto raw clay. I thought again and again about the curdled smell and texture of disposable nappies, though I'd never touched one. Outside, the heat carried itself in drifts. I noticed how the satellite signals would stick to the cold streams, whereas people tended to follow the warm. I was halfway out on my walk to Minto before I remembered my birthday. I was standing in a field watching two identical piebald horses feed off the same bit of forage. I thought I might be experiencing a medical emergency. I couldn't perceive any difference between the horses, and my boots were stuck to the ground. I should have worn trousers. I got a tick, pulled it out wrong, and left its leg inside my leg. I sat down, but instead of getting maudlin about it, I decided to welcome it. I sang, its legs inside my leg, to the tune of the farmer in the dell, for a few rounds, and picked at it for a while with a key without looking, quicker and harder as the nerves died off. By the time I looked back at the wound, it was awful, the size of a disc, and deep. I headed to the sea to wash it. There was a stone on the beach, and the stone was important. When I picked it up, I realised I could not go back to the city. There were feathers on the beach, and the feathers were our father. I picked them up to make them part of my inventory. They smelled sweet, like airborne diseases. Also in my inventory. A bottle opener, a menstrual cup, a lighter, a colouring book found at a bus stop, a cordless rape alarm. The colouring book was esoteric. I could ask it questions and it would find a way to answer. Example, I once asked the book whether I should enter a church that I had found. I closed my eyes and opened a page of the colouring book at random. It was the page that showed a chimney sweep doffing his hat. The doffing was a welcoming thing. It meant that I was welcome to explore the church. While bathing in a creek, I found a bag of ham, its plastic bow tie handles wedged under a rock. I broke into the bag, peeled off a small pink piece, and put it in my mouth. The ham had the feel and taste of wet tissue paper. I spat it into the stream, even though I was starving, and discarded the bag. I cried for myself as I watched the pink mush travel away on tiny bubbles of saliva. I found an empty shed with unbroken windows. I counted myself lucky and lay down in the dog bed that was on the floor with a tarpaulin sheet for cover. I fell into a heavy sleep and dreamed a procession of pure breeds, two Dalmatians side by side, an Afghan hound, and some smaller ones like a Sharpe with breathing problems. You could hear it in the panting. When I woke, woke from the dream, there was a dog right over me, a mongrel with cataracts. The mongrel stayed looking for a moment before leaving, unhurried. Small white monkeys stretch around in the dirt beneath a tree, but do not get dirty. They pick themselves up and dash away across the concrete plain, bobbing out of sight. They are silent. I see faces in objects so frequently. Is this empathy? A door handle, a gate, a bony rock, a refuse sack, a tree, a church, a glove, a button, an icon. On an oriental lamp base, a floral design becomes a kind of ugly peony bonnet baby, petulant and saccharine. Finally, I'm happy, I think. I eat some supplements, drink some coffee, and for hours, everything is interesting. I take over 200 photos on my phone. Everything is poetry. Everything is trompe l'oeil. I try to think objectively about the discrete elements required of a masterpiece. I become itchy then. I fall asleep. The following evening is my dinner with the curator. I wear a fresh white gown. During le plat principal, my left bell sleeve slides through a rich sauce as I reach for my glass, but when I retract it, the sauce slides right off. I bother the sleeve edge with my fingers for the rest of the evening. The white monkeys watch me from a pylon far away. The dinner is ultimately disappointing. I had nothing to say, barely knowing any of the names the curator mentioned, and on the few occasions I purported to recognise one, further discussion revealed me to be inept. I feel terribly guilty after the drink wears off. 
I remember at one point noticing in my behaviour that I was more or less pretending to be the curator's daughter. The next day, I am offered an interview with a contemporary art magazine. I accept the invitation, and they never email again. I wake up a day not long after, covered in milk. My nipples are leaking warm stuff all over. I get up and notice that I am pregnant. My belly is huge. I update my social media profiles with the news. The curator stops contacting me. The editors stop contacting me. Only one or two of my peers continue to send me emails and they have so little to say. They ask for updates on me and the pregnancy, but the interest is all feigned. I cry and smoke packets of white cigarettes and don't tell anyone. I tell everyone I'm not pregnant anymore. They have even less to say to me. Soon, I have a baby. After a declaration of interest, I wait 32 months before I am invited to attend my pre-appointment at the Tropical Midnight Society. I locate the address provided in the email and arrive as instructed, freshly bathed with clean hair, dark, breathable clothes and no makeup makeup. The chorus welcome me into a subterranean car park, dimly lit. They ask my name, Claudia Pulchra, and I tell them Claudia Pulchra. The air is thick and busy with incense. Members on the outer edge of the chorus are swinging single-chain thuribles. Electricity bursts like water from tubes in the exposed ceiling above us. We are surrounded by customised vehicles. I am asked to give details pertaining to my application. I tell the chorus that I have information to ruin a man. The Meister distributes a set of photocopies. As the chorus study the handout, I glimpse a figure escape through a side door, and next to the door, a heap of snakes with snake eggs. The photocopies show a series of photographs of small, green-yellow bruises. I am asked to create a password, after which I am no longer permitted to look the Meister in the eye. I am led into an adjoining room where I must wait for a period. I fall asleep against an industrial appliance, and when I awake, a woman with sympathies has appeared. I put my hand in my pocket and thumb the lion he lion's head of my inner resources before my clothes are taken from me. When the initiation comes, it is brutal and quick. As we approach the climax, I seek out my reflection. I find it in the windows of a souped-up electric blue car. I see that I am wet with sweat, a whole piece of skin has come away from my hairline, my lips are puckered and shining. Suddenly I can smell myself, my armpits like hot squealing oil. I hear the vehicles rev their engines in tandem as black oil streams down my inner thighs. A voice, my own, calls me. I tread up to the steel pulpit like the sphinx that I am, bottom heavy. The Meister hands me a triangular white mouth covering to wear, and I take it and turn it upside down and wear it as a crown. Um, another one of the shorter poems. Um, this poem takes the form of a letter um, addressed to number 24601, which... I think we'd usually uh, reference Jean Valjean, but um, in this instance has a slightly uh, different point of origin. So uh, a few years ago, about 10 poets were commissioned to write responses um, by uh, the arts collective in London clinic um, to The Simpsons. Um, everyone took their favourite character from The Simpsons and wrote a poem about them. Um, my favourite character is undoubtedly Selma Bouvier of the man-hating, chain-smoking twins, Patty and Selma. Um, and this poem, which obviously took quite a different turn in the end, was initially based on the episode where Selma begins um, writing via the prison pen pal programme to Sideshow Bob. Um, and there's a short excerpt from her letter to Sideshow Bob included in this piece. Dear number 24601, the future is an eye that I don't dare look into. Last night I dreamed I was a ball of fire and woke up on the wrong side of the room. This is a recurring dream. 
I share an apartment with my twin sister. Enclosed is a photo of us on a tandem bike. I forget which one I am. Sometimes I wake up believing I am her, she is me, and there is nothing about the day to indicate otherwise. Weeks stack up this way. As a girl, I did not do well with other children. Unable to see the fun in games, which were only ever maddening, I paid close attention to the weather, delighting in hail and not much else, save a prized collection of Hummel figurines, derived from the pastoral sketches of Sister Maria Innocentia Hummel, German Franciscan nun and talented artist. Her simple, peaceful works drew the enduring hatred of Hitler himself. You know... Hummel translates as bumblebee in German, and they say she was always buzzing around. What do you think? Do we grow into our names, or does Kismet know a thing? One name can mean too much, the other not nearly enough. The details make a difference, like sitting on the white cushion as opposed to the blue. White is pure, of course, but my soul's been in the bargain bin since Russia and Lenin's tomb. I had a moment there, among the balustrades, and once that moment had expired, it graduated from a moment to a life. Um, going to read from one of the other lyric essays, which is something I've never read aloud before. Um, this piece uh, concerns story of O, so it would seem completely remiss of me not to read it for the first time here in Paris. Um, I think perhaps the re reason I haven't yet read it to an audience is because it requires me to say the words gaping anus. Um, I don't think it's so shocking. Um, it begins with uh, a short, well, a long quote from Denise Riley's Words of Selves and finishes with a very short quote from Clarice Lispector's The Passion According to GH. And as well as being about Story of O, it's also a piece that sort of engages with one of the book's main concerns, which is the um, difficulty or rather the impossibility of adequate self expression. A Whistle in the Gloom. The feeling of inauthenticity under certain linguistic circumstances, of not being able to tell the truth however strenuously one struggles to reach it, isn't this feeling commoner than is usually acknowledged? The very grammar of the language of self-reference seems to demand, indeed to guarantee, an authenticity closely tied to originality, yet simultaneously it cancels this possibility. Any I seems to speak for and from herself. Her utterance comes from her own mouth in the first person pronoun, which is hers, if only for just so long as she pronounces it. Yet as a human speaker, she knows that it's also everyone's and that this grammatical offer of uniqueness is untrue, always snatched away. My autobiography always arrives from somewhere outside me. My narrating I is really anybody's, promiscuously. Never mind the coming story of my life. Simply to enunciate that initial I makes me slow down in confusion. Pauline Réage's story of O follows the title character as she submits herself to the sexual predilections of a secret society. At the novel's outset, O's lover, René, takes her to a chateau on the outskirts of Paris, where she is trained to serve the society's associates. O is flayed. She is manhandled and chained to the chateau's walls for hours at a time. She is instructed on matters pertaining to the society's sartorial customs and preferences. She is penetrated by one man after another in regular orgiastic sessions. René looks on. During one such session, an associate has difficulty entering O and demands that she have her anus stretched, which she does after René approves the modification in increments. Subsequent tri trials follow at various locations as René's initial ownership of O is passed on to one man after another. O's second owner, Sir Stephen, has one of her labia pierced and adorned with a series of rings that form a heavy chain. To the heavy chain is attached a small disc engraved with a motif that signifies O's subjugation. O consents to everything. My own copy of Riage's text, a cracked black paperback with a spare whitish font that dubs her novel the erotic classic, offers readings two distinct endings. In the first, O, wearing nothing but a highly realistic bird mask, is led into a ball where she has made a strange attraction for its guests. The children, a boy and a girl, are among those who engage with O. 
the boy forces the girl who is wearing a white dress, indicating that this is her first ball, to sit down next to O and touch her breasts, to run her hand over O's labia, her piercing, its chain and tag. The young girl complies in silence and then listens in silence as the boy tells her how, one day in the very near future, he will have the same thing done to her. Once the ball's attendants disperse, O is led to a stone platform where she is once again penetrated by multiple men. In the second alternative ending, O kills herself or asks to be killed when Sir Stephen makes clear his intention to relinquish her. Pauline Rayage was a pseudonym for Dominique Ory, a journalist, translator and editor at renowned literary publishers Gallimard. When she was willingly unmasked in an article in the New Yorker in 1994, 50 years after story of O's initial publication in France, the disparity between the book's author, Ori's professional public persona, and Rayage's narrative, its sadomasochistic content, was relayed in tones of surprise. In the article, Ori relates having started writing the book hotly and privately, at night, in bed for her lover Jean Paulin, in an effort to revive what she perceived to be his waning interest. Already a well-known intellectual and Ori's superior at Gallimard, Paulin saw to it that Story of O was published and tried to improve its chances of commercial success by contributing a preface. In this text, titled A Slave's Revolt, Paulin professes again and again his ignorance of the true author of the book, stating that the manuscript has the look of a letter more than of a diary. But to whom is the letter addressed, he writes, and whom does the discourse aim to convince? Whom is one to ask? I don't even know who you are. Ori was herself not sure. Asked about the book's sex scenes, she was adamant that the fantasies were neither her own nor something that, in the end, she particularly imagined would stimulate Paulin, but belonged to an entity whose origins and shape she could not trace. I saw, between what I thought myself to be and what I was relating and thought I was making up, both a distance so radical and a kinship so profound that I was incapable of recognising myself in it, she explained. I no doubt accepted my life with such patience or passivity or weakness only because I was so certain of being able to find whenever I wanted that other obscure life that is life's consolation. Of the childish chains and whips, she said, all I know is that they were beneficent and protected me mysteriously. In a reading of Rayage's text, the symbolism of O is impossible to resist, despite the author's consistent attestations as to the letter's arbitrary nature. Here I will purge the associations by listing them. Zero, none, an exclamation, archaic, a lament, archaic, an interjection, archaic, a circle, a ring, any body orifice, including a gasping mouth or gaping anus, and, more tenuously, the grand rooms and dungeons to whose walls O is fixed. A mirror, an eye, a wound. O was originally named after a friend of Rayage's, Odile, a moniker shared by Piotr Tchaikovsky's Black Swan and Odile of Alsace, patron saint of good eyesight. Shortly, however, Rayage found herself unable to project O's experiences onto Odile, and so erased the majority of the name, rendering her protagonist an initial, a conspicuous lack. Initial, from the Latin for standing at the beginning. At the beginning of the book, O is not standing, but sitting in a car, a cab. Her skirt gathered up in order to allow her bare genitals to rest directly on the vehicle's leather upholstery. Before I know the details of its origins, Story of O is a book I treat as an artefact, a ruin I explore for its beauty, its strangeness, its shattered intimidations. I rub my open palms across its scaly parapets while looking out at the developing world I usually inhabit. During one such visit, O seems to affect its own modality, to constitute a part of speech other than its designation as a proper noun. O heard a whistle in the gloom. O placed a new log on the fire. O listened and trembled from happiness. I type out these disembodied phrases and read them again and again until, whimsically, 
and for moments at a time, I allow myself to comprehend own not as an initial, but as a personal pronoun, a Rubenesque alternative to I, an innovation in grammar signifying a tacit acknowledgement of the paradoxes of self-expression, a room to live and breathe in with some honesty. I recently read in another poet's poem a passage that claimed apparently impersonal poems as the byproducts of trauma. I witnessed, noiselessly, a thought forming. I watched it take shape as one watches a small movement in the distance with a fleeting sense of calm. I read the passage again and I understood it. I understood it and I felt the shame rise. I knew that the poet was right, and I knew that she was absolutely wrong. Creating isn't imagination. It's taking the great risk of grasping reality. Um, I'll just finish with two shorter poems from the book. Thank you for listening. You've been a very patient audience. Um, this poem is a reference to uh, Salima Hill, who I mentioned briefly briefly earlier, and her collection Bunny, and it feels uh, particularly apt for me to read at the moment, um, referencing, as I think it does presciently, the sort of hellish news cycle that we're stuck in at the moment, and the ways in which women's testimonies are being disbelieved. Bunny. Where did the dust come from? And how much of it do you have? When and where did you first notice the dust? Why didn't you act sooner? Why don't you show me a sample? Why don't you have a sample? Why don't you take some responsibility for yourself, the dust? Personally, I've never suffered from or even seen the dust. No one I know has reported issues. These are facts. The difference between us is the difference between facts and lies. You tell lies. Not only do you lie about the dust, but you lie about or altogether conceal your reasons for having fabricated such a complaint. Any reason I can conceive of that might have prompted you to fabricate such a complaint is unrelated, and in any case, is of your own doing. Have you considered the impact of your complaint on the ones you love? I recommend you write out your issues with the dust in a draft email and then delete it. You need to forget about the dust. There's simply no alternative for you. Do you want to lose your children? I met them earlier, in the foyer, if you remember, and they didn't cough once. Don't blame the dust for your poor parenting. The dust is not an autonomous entity. The dust appears, if anything, to be synonymous with your own sense of guilt. And if that's true, then all is dust. These words, Bunny. Um, the final poem I read from the very end of the book is uh, a sort of antidote to that one. Um, it's a prose poem as well, um, but much shorter than the engine, and it's uh, essentially a revenge fantasy. A.S. And what was it Anna Sophia couldn't say? That all had started with Arlo, when she had started up with Arlo, who'd been nice enough, but whose presence had turned her into herself. And so first the faces, then mainly the eyes, but in the end, all of it really. And what was it she couldn't say she was after? To smash to pieces the earthenware jug on the stovetop, the sound of a veil tearing? Both were nice ideas, but she couldn't stick with them. She walked around a bit and started to blurt things out. She told old men just how much they smelled, that their breath smelled and more, and this got her into some real trouble. A white old man, pale lizard face, small teeth, paper neck, hat the colour of yellow dog shit. He came at her in an alleyway with a red tie just as bad, and, quick as she needed to be, A.S. had pulled out a razor knife. Could have been Arlo's, could have been anyone's, and flicked it at his papery neck. She would tell them she had been where she had always intended to be that day, in September 2013. The Mushrooms and Health Summit, Washington, D.C., and if it didn't get her off, it wouldn't. It didn't matter. Powerful, she can cook. Thank you.
Um, thank you for the reading, Sophie. Uh, the narrator in the title poem, who is Mary Sue, says, I begin to collect quotations, responses, and the book feels to me like a sustained, developing investigation. Could you tell us how it came together as a collection? Yeah, so we spoke... Oh, I just to let us know. Hello? Hi. Um, so we talked about this a bit briefly earlier, and I was sort of saying how, I think, for a poetry collection, it was a slightly unusual um, origin story in terms of its having been more or less commissioned uh, from an excerpt of poems that was about 20 poems long sort of pieces that I'd written over a period of, of five years or so um, and then sort of more in the way of a novel um, the book itself was commissioned and I think at that stage I was aware that I didn't want it to be sort of a mere collection of poems written over a certain period of time as it currently was um, but that I wanted it to attempt something somewhat more <coughs> ambitious um, so that was when the sort of uh, extended fragmentary essays came in they felt like they were drawing lines between the already existing poems that um, possibly wouldn't have otherwise been um, drawn by readers themselves so in that way they sort of are intended to direct the reading but um, and something that's difficult convey to convey in um, a reading like this is, is the amount of white space in the book um, which I think is a sort of uh, counter to that instruction or direction it's sort of um, implying that there are gaps holes for the reader to fall through in the text, um, which is the case with all of my favourite books, whether poetry or fiction. Yeah, thank you. Um, something I loved about the collection as well was how many female authors you quote, discuss, engage with. Um, Rachel Kirsk, Sharon Olds, I could go on. Um, and I think we all probably grew up with what was a predominantly male canon. And I was wondering if you could talk about your reading habits and if they've changed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, like, as you say, and as we've read in interviews with uh, writers that I really admire, people like Elena Ferrante, we sort of talk about the internalized um, misogyny uh, that you grow up with as a woman. Um, and, you know, even as uh, someone who reads a lot at a young age, um, so like Ferrante or Natalia Ginsberg or any of these other authors I was reading only men as a teenager and I think um, certainly had uh, you know misogynistic ideas about women in society in general and definitely viewed women's writing as inferior whether or not that was something that was consciously articulated or not um, so I think in my early 20s um, quite a few years before this came out I started reading exclusively women um, and that's something that I held up until very recently um, which is why I was very embarrassed to show you the Knausgaard <laughs> book <laughs> the other afternoon because it feels like <laughs> breaking that sort of edge with perhaps you know the most prototypically sort of male author out there um, yeah so I think that is uh, the 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 discussions in the book are the sort of natural consequence yeah. of that drastic shift in reading habits. Yeah. Um, and the book use many, uses many different forms, um, sometimes more formal poems and sometimes more unusual. Um, for instance, who is Mary Sue using sourced interviews mm -hmm. and um, Ed where most of the poem is just a footnote. Mm -hmm. um, how important is the variety of forms for you mm. in the collection? I think um, when I started writing a lot of the work in here, I was living in Northern Ireland, and obviously there's a there's a huge um, heritage there when it comes to form, and um, I'm aware of a lot of other writers my age who find who find form um, set form that is a way to get into writing poems, but I think for me, um, it's often felt a sort of limiting um, parameter and I think 
with poems like Ed, where, as you say, the majority of the poem it takes place in the footnotes, um, it just feels like following the poem to its own natural conclusion, rather than providing myself with a sort of preordained form that I then have to sort of fill in the blanks. Um, that feels like an incredibly reductive account of the way that form can work, but I think it's, yeah, for me, it's just about trying to sort of access the truth in the poem and, and to follow that to whatever form it ends up taking. Yeah. Um, and I think a part of the reason that I've kind of felt able to do that is um, to do with not having grown up in the UK. Um, I think a lot of um, sort of poets my age and whose work I admire a great deal um, definitely f sort of feel the weight of influence um, in the form of, uh, you know, the Anglophone canon. Um, but it's, although ob obviously it's something I'm aware of and studied at university, it's something that I felt was less imposed on me at, at school age. So um, I think I felt perhaps more comfortable um, flouting certain rules. Yeah. Um, I noticed that many of the poems as well mention or depict saints and miracles in the collection and I can see a link between idealization um, and Mary Susan Saints but maybe you could explain more clearly why why they're so present in the collection yeah there's no there's no very clever answer to that I think <laughs> reviewers have said some very clever things about purity and subjugation um, but I simply became, in this sort of almost very conscious effort not to write personal poetry, yeah. um, interested in religious iconography. Um, it seemed just a really sort of rich um, source material. And um, yeah, a lot of the extended metaphors that came out of writing about that type of imagery, again, felt um, really... Uh, sort of open to some of the concerns that I had that again might not have been consciously realized but were sort of latently coming out in these extended metaphors like in the in the healer's poem yeah. um hmm. okay um I'm aware we don't have so much time left um so I'd like to move on to leave some time for audience questions uh does anyone have anything they'd like to ask Sophie Collins if you just put your hand up, then someone will come around with a microphone. Any questions? Okay, well, I'll use the last few minutes. Oh. Um, I really like that you started with... Uh, Can you just wait yeah. for the mic? Uh, I really like that you started with a poem uh, that you said was the oldest in the collection. And I also really like that, as you said, non-personal poems with different speakers. So I was wondering if there's a relation, like maybe something to be learned from the relationship between the speaker in the first poem versus the speakers in the poems that are more recent. Mm. More recent in the collection. Yeah, more recently written. Yeah, I think possibly the difference between uh, the the speaking voice in Healers and maybe in something that was written much later, something like The Engine, um, was um, a conscious awareness of <coughs> that sort of drive to uncover personal truths through um, impersonal subject matter. Um, I, again to refer back to Selima Hill was reading a lot of her work and a lot of interviews with her and she's someone who's sort of described a, described as a surrealist poet and I don't think that's quite right um, for me her poems although they sort of recast people in her lives as animals or they change the gender they're intensely personal um, and I think perhaps I have become a more personal writer in that way but I think much like Selima Hill I'm only able to I feel access the emotional truth of a situation by fictionalizing. Um, I think to describe something, a real event, um, perhaps a traumatic event in a direct way, somehow removes its charge. Um, and I think 
maybe that sort of fictionalizing of the real is is what I'm moving consciously towards in the newer work. Are there any other questions? Hi. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, the comment you made about the review that you got from the from the TLS about uh, the uh, the more kind of didactic essays as being kind of sort of chiding, um, you know, of course that it, it's condescending and that's you know irritating. But also, do you uh, do you get the sense that it's wrong also in that it ignores that there is kind of a a desire among readers for. Um, for books that sort of come with like an internal like critical apparatus um, because I think a lot of at least a lot of the young writers that I meet are kind of tired of that uh, that old adage of like show don't tell I think there's a real kind of desire you know out like a palpable f desire for like no just tell us what's going on and I want to hear you talk about it because that could be really interesting too yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly um, the way that I've approached writing the book is reflective of my own desire for a book that functions in that way. Um, and I do think they exist. Um, you know, I'm thinking of someone perhaps like Lisa Robertson, who sort of tells you what she's doing as she's doing it. And um, again, I think all of my own favorite contemporary poetry is intensely self-reflexive in that way. And um, although the reviewer did say he felt chided, um, I felt that it was uh, interested um, rather than a sort of uh, negative comment. Um, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's a great observation. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? I think that's all we've got time for. Um, but do stick around, have a glass of wine. Um, we've got plenty of copies of Who is, Who is Mary Sue for sale, and I think Sophie would be happy to sign them. Yeah. Um, you can get the book here, but please do remember to pay for it downstairs before you leave. Um, so one more time, I'd like to thank Sophie Collins. Sophie Collins.